That may be the greatest catch I've ever seen in my life. Okay, we're going to go through and talk about some players that I've been getting a ton of questions about as of late in the live streams. They've been disappointing over the past few weeks, and we've essentially been getting a lot of questions as, can I buy low? Should I be looking to cash out now? I'm going to be really happy to talk about every single player, and we're going to go and we're going to cover at least one player from every position. But of course, before we get into it, you know we have to give away some fantasy flock network hats so we can have the people in the flock out there representing, looking like a stud. Now let's pull up our winners for this. This video this first one gonna come out from ryan says let's go mason you're clutching up for my team this year no thank you my friend and then alexander as well says you help a lot mason mvp on youtube one question mitchell or zach moss thanks in advance no thank you and we're gonna go zach moss i mean that buffalo bills offense gonna be putting up a million points against the miami dolphins this week but before we get into this video, two announcements. If you want a Fantasy Flock Network ad, of course, you can go down there, try to get a free one by leaving that comment, dropping a like, subscribing to the channel. You can also go join the Flock on Patreon. We're over there on Patreon. You actually get our rest of season rankings. You get our dynasty rankings. You get in our group chat. You get a Fantasy Flock Network ad. You get a podcast breaking down your own fantasy team in the direction it should be going in once you join the Patreon community. And I mean... You just get to be a part of something that's very special and growing over there on Patreon. And also, go use promo code FLOCK on Underdog Fantasy. When you use promo code FLOCK on Underdog Fantasy, you can find the link in the description of the video and you make at least a $10 deposit. You get a 100% match on that deposit up to $100 when you use promo code FLOCK. They have drafts. They have player props. Thomas, can you please show the player props up on the screen as we go through and discuss these players? So yeah, those are the best ways that you can support the channel. And let's go through. Let's just dive into this list. And let's start it off with something y'all are going to be rolling your eyes with, or at least you should be rolling your eyes with. And let's discuss the Kansas City Chiefs skill positional players here because everybody knows. I mean, nobody's really been falling into the idea that you should be lowering your value on Patrick Mahomes, who's currently the quarterback two in fantasy but we've actually had a lot of questions centering around Tyree Kill and Travis Kelsey this week. And I'm getting a lot of questions like, oh, should I be selling Travis Kelsey for someone like James Robinson, Stefan Diggs? Should I just be cashing out? I'm like, what the hell are you talking about? Why would we ever look to sell Travis Kelsey at this point? Now, I understand this Kansas City Chiefs offense, they're not close to what they were in 2018. This Chiefs offense doesn't look like what they did in 2019 or 2020 either. But still, that has not prevented these top-end players from coming away with a ridiculous amount of production. Where so far this season, Travis Kelsey, he's the bona fide tight end one. It is not even close from him in the rest of the field. He's giving you that elite positional advantage that you drafted him for. And if you're looking at Travis Kelsey, it's not trending in the wrong direction whatsoever. I mean, with Kelsey here, over the past three weeks, he's had double digit targets in each contest. He's had 65 targets through seven weeks so far. So he's almost getting there almost to 10 targets a game at the tight end position. That's impossible to come by. I just want to be having a quick statement. We don't need to be talking about this in depth, but with this Kansas city chiefs offense, you're looking at Kelsey still being the tight end one. I mean, Tyree kill still is the wider receiver too. So far this season, those players have been elite all year now. There's no reason to be panicking. I mean, this is pretty much the worst case scenario for the Kansas city chiefs. If anything, maybe you are bullish on them going forward, knowing that this Chiefs offense should limit those turnovers, have more trips to the red zone. But let me remind everyone where we stand on the Chiefs offense if it's not going to be what it has been over the past few seasons. We are going to have to drastically lower expectations for all secondary wide receivers in this offense. Someone like McCole Hardman, who I was saying was a very intriguing draft pick at the end of your drafts this season based on the upside that he had if this offense was going to be at that 2018 level. He's someone that we can go out and just cut if for whatever reason you did not listen to us and you decided to wait waste the roster spot and pick up Josh Gordon off the waiver wire. Please, for the love of God, if you didn't listen to us three weeks ago, go out there and cut Josh Gordon right now. Just no real upside there. And in the case of the starting running back, whether it's Daryl Williams, whether it's Clyde edwards alaire you have to be lowering your expectations down because you're not necessarily saying that either one of those running backs are talented in the slightest. I mean, I've called each running back a decent value in certain weeks with where the market is standing. And that's never me coming out and saying, oh, Clyde edwards alaire he's an elite talent. Clyde was like, he's going to win out. No, you're never making that argument with either running back. We know that both Daryl Williams and Clyde Rizalaire are very below average running backs. 
the thought process behind the play from a fantasy football standpoint is that if their offense is leading the NFL in red zone opportunities, that they can still be intriguing plays based on touchdown upside alone. But if that's not going to be the case, if the Chiefs are not number one in red zone opportunities, then those running backs have to drastically go down your rankings, especially when we know that the percentage of those red zone opportunities are going to be definitely skewed in the direction of the passing game with players like Travis Kelsey. So Kelsey, Hill, Mahomes, you don't change a single thing of. You lower the running backs down your rankings and you just go through and drop any wide receiver from the team not named Tyree Kill. Now, our next running back will be someone that we included on a sell high running back list like a month ago at this point. And I'm not going to lie. I have him on a decent amount of my own rosters. Let's go through and let's look at Miles Sanders here. Now with Miles Sanders, he has the ankle injury. I mean, this is just yet another reason to go through and begin to panic. And it's kind of funny with what we have seen from Miles Sanders so far this season. I mean, this is a player that has not lived up to expectations in the slightest. And you've had Kenneth Gainwell. I mean, splitting that backfield with Miles Sanders pretty much all season now. And what is really interesting is that Miles Sanders has not been put on the IR, but we know he's going to be missing this week. And now you're going to get to see Kenneth Gainwell in what is presumably the lead running back role. Now, yes, we probably get some Boston Scott. We probably get a little bit of Jordan Howard, but we know that Gainwell is going to see a boosted opportunity share and Miles Sanders hasn't been that great with the touches that he has had so far this season. If you're looking at the efficiency, this is someone that is yet to score a touchdown on over 80 touches. Now, of course, we know that touchdowns are very volatile in fantasy football. Jalen Hurts has vultured a lot of those at the goal line as well. So it's hard to hold that too much against Miles Sanders. But just from a coaching staff standpoint, you're not going to be surprised if Kenneth Gainwell comes in here and he impresses knowing that this coaching staff has no allegiance to Miles Sanders, who was drafted in the second round back in 2019. I mean, this is something that you see all the time. You see the new coaching staff coming in and those former players that maybe have the team investment. I mean, they're not tied to them in particular. So if Kenneth Gainwell comes out and he impresses in this week against the Lions, possibly next week against the Los Angeles Chargers, a backfield split that was in the direction of 65% for Miles Sanders, 35% for Kenneth Gainwell, maybe going in the direction of it being a 50-50 split split truly, which is something that I was not predicting at all coming into this season. But Miles Sanders, I'm really glad that once we saw what this offense was going to look like at the beginning of the season, we just kind of washed our hands. We go, you know what? Miles Sanders, probably a solid sell high, even though we're not getting that exact value that you had him in drafts. But if we can just try to get whatever we can now at this point with Miles Sanders, it's really hard to go through and actually trade him for anything, given the fact that he is dealing with that ankle injury. If you were going to be looking to sell Sanders, it's going to be in a very specific way. And essentially how you would have to be doing it is you'd have to be attaching him to another one of your running backs that is currently healthy now to try to get that immediate upgrade. Just so if you can try to capitalize on any of the name value that Miles Sanders has, because a big thing also is that they're not going to put Miles Sanders on the IR. And this is going to be a situation like we've seen with Devontae Parker, for instance, where he just kind of lingers and he's just out week to week, but he's not on the IR. So you can't move him from your bench to your IR spot. You're going to be wasting a roster spot as well with Miles Sanders. Now, he has some good matchups down the stretch. I mean, he has the Jets in week 13, the Giants in week 12, the Giants in week 16. With Miles Sanders, I'd say if we can go through, if we can package him with another depth running back to get someone like Javante Williams, I think that'd be a great sell. But the problem is you're just really not getting any value for him right now. And you probably shouldn't be. Now, our next running back that I'm not going to lie, I have no idea what to say when people ask us about him in the live stream. This is someone that I liked coming into this season, knowing that we were expecting the offensive line to be a lot better than other people were, knowing that we were expecting Jamar Chase to be able to effectively take take the top off this defense and have Joe Mixon going up against less stacked boxes. And I was also expecting with Joe Mixon that no Giovanni Bernard was going to be giving him a bump up with his receiving game usage. Well, that hasn't necessarily been the case where we have seen two weeks so far from Joe Mixon of oh, he has had that flash where he is getting implemented in the receiving game. Where back in week one, he had four receptions back in week six. He had five receptions out of the backfield. Outside of that, I mean, Joe Mixon has yet to have another game with multiple receptions. So you're seeing Joe Mixon in a very similar role to what we had the previous season, the season before that, the season before that. I had really wanted to go all in on Mixon 
with the idea that if he could get up to just say about three receptions a game, three and a half receptions a game with how productive this offense would be overall in the touchdown upside that you would have here, Joe Mixon was a locked and loaded player and essentially a discount Ezekiel Elliott. Clearly, that has not played out in the way we would want it to. Now, it's really hard to look at the recent usage for Joe Mixon. And then in week seven, if you're pulling up the snap split between him and Samaj P. Ryan, we have to keep in mind that that game against the Ravens was just completely out of hand, where P. Ryan, of course, was going to be getting the snaps. Of course, he was going to be getting the touches in the fourth quarter. The week before that against the Lions, where Joe Mixon pops off for almost, I mean, over 150 total yards, his five receptions, a receiving touchdown as well. I mean, yes, that's great, but it was against the Lions, and it was also in a contest where Samaj P. Ryan was on the COVID list. It's just so hard to look at this because also against the Packers, this is a running back in Joe Mixon that he wasn't fully healthy. He was coming back from the ankle injury that he suffered in week four against the Jacksonville Jaguars. So if we're looking at week four, this is a running back that in the fourth quarter had that ankle injury, missed the remainder of the game. So it seems like every single week you've had so far with Joe Mixon, we've had an asterisk attached to it one way or another, whether it's going back to week four, ankle injury, week five, still not healthy, week six, I mean, Samaj P. Ryan on the COVID list. Week seven, the Cincinnati Bengals drop 40-something points against the Baltimore Ravens to the point where Joe Mixon doesn't have to play in the second half. So with Mixon here, if you kind of map this out, I still think based on how productive this offense is going to be and with how much more talented he is than the other secondary running backs in Cincinnati, this will be a running back that I know a lot of people have wanted to get worried about the Samaj P. Ryan usage. I think that we probably stand by him. Because, I mean, going back to what we were discussing and why we liked him compared to consensus coming into the year, Jamar Chase was going to be able to take the safeties and make sure that they're keeping two back at all times, or you know Jamar Chase will be able to get behind him. And also, the offensive line is going to be better than expected. So two out of the three reasons that you like Joe Mixon coming into the season have been true so far. So I think we just kind of maybe ride it out from here and really hope that Joe Mixon does begin to get more targets out of the backfield. It hasn't been horrible. He has averaged over two targets a game, but I mean, that's not much better than Damian Harris. Okay, so now let's go to our next player. Actually going to be at the wide receiver position, someone that we called a sell-high candidate a while ago, someone that we have not ranked in our top 24 wide receivers in a very long time, Tyler Lockett. Now with Lockett in particular, this is not a wide receiver that I'm telling you to buy right now. But the time to buy Tyler Lockett is going to be Going into week 10, because you know this is kind of what we discussed with DK Metcalf and Tyler Lockett. In the case of DK Metcalf, hasn't really worked out that well just because he had that spike week last week with that long receiving touchdown. But with Geno Smith coming in, we are saying panic on all Seattle Seahawks players. Just go through and avoid them everywhere you can. With Tyler Lockett this week in particular, going up against the Jacksonville Jaguars, I know in theory it's a decent matchup in terms of just this defense not being good, but still Geno Smith is not going to be able to hit him with the deep ball as we have discussed at length. So you're going to be looking at Tyler Lockett. Since we called him a sell high in week two, I know we're not necessarily saying that we are able to predict the Russell Wilson injury, but still, since week two, Tyler Lockett, seven fantasy points, six fantasy points, 10 fantasy points, five fantasy points, three fantasy points. If we have another disappointing performance against the Jacksonville Jaguars in week eight, I think the value will truly bottom out on Tyler Lockett. And I think that's going to give us a great buy low opportunity. Hopefully you drafted Tyler Lockett in drafts this year. Hopefully you sold him high after week two, as we discussed, because if we can buy him going into just say week 10, coming out of the week nine buy, he'll already be through his buy. We'll be that much closer to Russell Wilson coming back to Seattle. So we'll be in a great position for Tyler Lockett to see the bump up in efficiency of the overall offensive environment, which is what we've already discussed in Tyler Lockett needing for him to be a productive wide receiver in fantasy. So I know it's really easy to panic on Tyler Lockett. We were panicking weeks ago whenever Russell Wilson had the injury, but I think after this week, after the bye, that will be the time to go through and take the dip and take the production with Tyler Lockett going forward. Now our next wide receiver has been unbelievably disappointing. Unbelievably, and I'll say I bought into the volume that he had, and I was saying, Oh no, we want to be starting Odell Beckham Jr. I was saying that Odell Beckham Jr., back after his first performance against the Chicago Bears, where he had nine targets, 
in Cleveland. He also had a carry as well. I was going, okay, if they're trying to get Odell the ball like this, if you have Jarvis Landry injured, 100% we want to be playing Odell Beckham Jr. in that. While you don't necessarily expect him to be the same level talent that he was before the injuries, still, the volume's going to be there in a run first offense. So we would naturally assume that the defensive scheme is to shut down the run. You'd imagine that Odell Beckham Jr. is a very effective and a very productive player if he's able to get to nine to eight targets a game. Where that just simply hasn't been the case. I mean, dear God, Odell Beckham Jr. has been bad. Odell Beckham Jr. has had less than a 50% catch rate so far this season. He's had 33 targets and 16 receptions. From a yards per target standpoint, also not great. I mean, if you're going to be looking at it, the amount of games that Odell Beckham Jr. has posted a 10 yards per target mark or higher is a total of zero. Odell Beckham Jr. has been horribly inefficient. Not to mention that you had Jarvis not playing in a couple of these games. So Odell was getting a bump up with his volume. Now he hasn't scored a touchdown so far this year, which you'd imagine the touchdown rate definitely has to go up. It can't go down and he's had 33 targets. So the underlying volume is there for Odell Beckham Jr. But going back to what we had in 2020, going back to what we had in 2019, we have not seen Odell Beckham Jr. have a productive season on a points per game standpoint since 2018. That was a very, very long time ago. So at this point, Odell Beckham Jr. is just a name. Now, you know the intro of this channel is the Odell Beckham Jr. catch just because I really fell in love with Dynasty Fantasy Football back in 2014. So that was that was a good moment for us who invested into those rookie wide receivers. I mean, I cannot even tell you all how exciting it was in 2014 with Sammy Watkins, Odell, Brandon Cooks, Mike Evans, Allen Robinson. Nonetheless, I love Odell. I always have a soft spot in my heart for him. But at this point, it looks like, I don't want to say you can cut Odell Beckham Jr., but you're getting pretty damn close. Now, our next wide receiver, Julio Jones with Julio Jones. Very simple. This is someone that has been injured. I think we want to be going through and taking the dip where we can with Julio. Or if you're pulling it up, yes, this past week was a fantastic matchup for Julio Jones against the Kansas City Chiefs. And you know, I've been the one screaming to buy A.J. Brown low pretty much all season now. And with Julio Jones here, this is someone that we kind of have stayed away from in some regards. But still, if you're going to be trying to predict Julio Jones going forward, I think looking at the production over the past two weeks is honestly not going to be helping you out whatsoever. I think it is almost going to be a disservice to you if you're trying to read too much into that. Just given the fact that with Julio Jones, I mean, he's been dealing with injuries where with that hamstring injury, he hasn't been practicing throughout the entire week. It's not like this is a situation where he's with the Atlanta Falcons, where he's been with Matt Ryan for a goddamn decade, where he doesn't have to go to practice. No, you would imagine that he has to go to practice. He has to get continued chemistry with Ryan Tannehill, and they have to try to figure out how to implement him in that scheme effectively. So with Julio Jones, I know it's another easy spot. Go, oh my God, are we panicking like Odell Beckham Jr.? Are we considering to go through and bench him? No, I would definitely prefer having Julio Jones going forward just because if he can get healthy, I think that we just simply haven't seen a healthy Julio Jones at all this year. Maybe the last time we saw that was against the Seattle Seahawks in week two. And in that game, he had eight targets, 128 receiving yards and six receptions. Now, our next wide receiver is going to be someone I have to bring up. I have to, have to, have to. We're going to be very brief on it. T Higgins, you now you've seen us ranking T Higgins in the top 24 wide receivers essentially every single week. We are going to continue that mark against the New York Jets this week. For the love of God, find a way to get T Higgins into your starting lineup. This is someone that since he come, came back from that shoulder injury, he has been near the very top of the Cincinnati Bengals with his target share. He has actually had more targets over the past three weeks since returning from that shoulder injury than Jamar Chase has had during that same span. And no, I am not saying that T. Higgins is someone you want over Jamar Chase. Jamar Chase has clearly demonstrated with his talent that he's going to be extremely more efficient with his touchdown rate and his yards per target than what you should expect with T. Higgins. However, to see this volume in a pass-happy offense that's going to be efficient with how Jamar Chase takes defensive attention, I think it would be stupid to get worried about T. Higgins at this moment. Now, yes, over the past three weeks, he has essentially averaged a little less than 10 points a game. He's been averaging like nine something points a game in a PPR format, but still you'd expect the touchdown rates going to be higher than league average, given the offense that he's playing in. And the fact that he is six, four, he's coming off a week in week seven, where he had 15 targets. Now, yes, he had seven receptions, 62 receiving guards. CJ Uzama stole a ton of that production here, but I think with T Higgins going forward, this is definitely a wide receiver. We want to be betting on 
Now, let, let me bring it up just for one second. I know that everybody is tired of hearing me talk about it. I am tired of saying it myself. We are not panicking on Calvin Ridley. Calvin Ridley has been a buy low wide receiver for us for weeks now. Very similar to how we are just consistently saying to buy low on AJ Brown, even though people were telling us to give it up. We're going to do the same thing here with Calvin Ridley. There's nothing to deter me from this stance. Now, yes, Kyle Pitts looked fantastic this past week. Kyle Pitts hopefully can continue to look great. That way we can get some defensive attention away from Calvin Ridley because we know the passing volume is going to be there with this Atlanta Falcons offense regardless. And here with Calvin Ridley, he had 10 targets this past week. This is someone that is averaging almost 11 targets a game. He had over 10 yards per target last season. 100% we're playing Calvin Ridley every chance we get. Please do not panic on Ridley. Do not sell him. Our last player we're going to be talking about will be Darren Waller. Darren Waller, we've had a million questions in the live stream asking if someone should go through and trade away Darren Waller. And I kind of understand the thought process. Darren Waller definitely has faded since his massive week one performance against the Ravens, where he had 10 receptions, 105 receiving yards, 19 targets. But still with Darren Waller, he's at the very top of the NFL with his targets per game. Very similar to what we discussed with Travis Kelsey at the beginning of this video. He is at nine targets a game so far this season. This is a tight end that clearly is still the focal point on his NFL offense. Now I know we know John Gruden, maybe you see his role change ever so slightly, but they decided to use Foster Moreau here as pretty much the focal point of their offense this past week. We know Darren Waller is a significantly better tight end. Darren Waller will be getting that workload when he is healthy. So given the production that we had from Moreau this past week, I think that he is definitely going to be a tight end that we we're trying to buy low on with Darren Waller, showing that that role with this new coaching staff is still very safe with the tight end. He has his bye week this week, so he's going to be able to get healthy from that ankle injury, and he should be good to go in week nine. Now, thank you. I really hope you enjoyed this video. Please go down there, drop that like, leave a comment. Of course, go join the flock over there on Patreon. Get a fantasy flock network hat. Get a podcast breaking down your fantasy team. Support the channel. Get our rest of season rankings. Get in our group chat. Go use promo code flock on underdog fantasy. You can find the link in the description of the video. Go check out some of those player props that we showed on the screen during this one. But yeah, that's all I got for you. Thank you so much and have a great day.